Okay, everybody, thanks for your patience. And if you guys could just stand up here for a minute to let some photographers do their work. Sir. Yes, Be everyone's gentle. been so nice, they've been feeding me, so I flew in a couple hours ago, and it came with a delicious little chicken sandwich, a coffee, a little uh, sweet pear. Some chocolate, maybe? Some chocolate, yes. You should have another drink, just to take the edge off. <laughs> no. Have a sip with that guy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, gentlemen, I wanted to start by asking you... Um, Oh, sweet nectar of the gods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they say that oh, yeah. sometimes outsiders can make the best films about America. So, what did yeah. you want to I'm say about sure, America? I'm not sure how true that is. Um, because it implies that you kind of come into America with a specific viewpoint or a specific take on the country that you want to explore. Where we, I just kind of wanted to make a kind of crazy anarchic black comedy. You know, and yeah, there are satirical aspects to the film. Now, that's the subtext, but on the, on, you know, on the face of it, it's meant to be a good time, sort of fun movie. Hopefully, the more times you watch the film, you realise there's more things going on. You know. And why did you want to set it in New Mexico? Uh, tax breaks. Okay. That was uh, the main reason. Uh, now I knew I wanted to be on the in the southwest on the border. Um, so it was either, you know, Texas or New Mexico. And I wanted the kind of um, the feel of a contemporary Western. Uh, so that was, that was the main visual element. And, uh, you know, I knew that, you know, if you, because of the light there and everything and the kind of whole widescreen look of the place, I knew that would be a great counterpoint to when they take off to Iceland, which is all chilly blue, you know. So it was a visual element as well. And Alexander, it's really refreshing to see you in a comedy. Is it as fun as it looks making a comedy, or is comedy harder to do? I was very, very excited. I haven't done a comedy in 10 years, and <clears throat> I was in London shooting Tarzan, which wasn't a comedy, and it was just <laughs> very kind of all-consuming, very intense experience. It was an incredible experience, but it was, it was very intense. So when I got the script, um, it was just very refreshing to, you know, page one, like he hits a mime and steals his cocaine, and. Um, he's drunk throughout the movie. Um, that's my main character right now. Um, um, no, but it was it was almost like a cathartic experience. To, um, I, I've been trying to find a comedy for for years, but um, it's just been hard finding. Um, I'm not a go-to guy for for comedy writers, uh, so I was very excited when I got this opportunity, and I thought it was just uh, my my type of comedy, my, my humor, I thought it was really irreverent and dark and weird and funny. And for both of you, what is it about bad cops that we love as an audience? Well, I, I guess, you know, the film is, it references the 70s and American cinema in the 70s, and they were kind of all bad cops at that time, really. Although they kind of had a heart of gold, eventually. Um, but these two guys don't really have a heart of gold, they're just corrupt. I guess my main reference was French Connection. I mean, Gene Hackman's Popo Doll isn't a very nice person. I mean, I haven't watched the film in a while, but I've got memories that he's, you know, he's pretty racist, he abuses his authority at any given opportunity. So I was kind of referencing that idea. Um, and you know, as we see from uh, news stories every uh, other day now, there are quite a lot of bad cops around, so it's never going to go out of fashion. <coughs> Did you watch any old buddy movies, cop movies, to prepare? Um, no, but I, I agree with John. I was, uh, who's not a fan of the old, like the '70s cop movies, and like especially like French Connection and um, that show, The Sweeney. Sweeney, really. yeah, there was a British show that was similar. Yeah. Yeah. We cut up. There was a, a really good uh, TV channel that did a cut up of all these '70s cop shows. 
and it's basically them jumping out of cars, punching people, you know, kicking doors in, and it was like it, that was sort of encapsulated everything we wanted to do in the film. Alex wanted to jump out of a moving car, it was a bit too dangerous. Oh yeah, we had a great idea. Yeah. They were always, they, they never parked their cars, they just jump out. But I I would, the, the, the idea wasn't to jump out of the car, the idea would be that, so you'd Mike, rock, you'd Mike, rock. Mike drives it, and I, no, I was gonna go out and go straight into a walk, so it would be like, if I'm on the passenger side, as Mike pulls up, I like open the door and I just start walking before yeah. it, it even stops. Um, <laughs> But then a moving car became a. a it was. A, a it didn't stunt. look very graceful, and it was kind of shit. But the idea, you can imagine how awesome it would have looked. It's like you go straight into the walk. Next time. Uh, yeah. We could have had you jumping up over the bonnet, though. I guess we could have done that. You know, where you just dive over the bonnet of the car. We were talking things. about it at the yeah. beginning when we come out. You know, when I slide over. Yeah. I guess we tried it, but I failed that as well. I'm kind of a shit physical <laughs> actor. I keep sliding off. Why don't we open it up to some of your questions? And I, I think we'll have a microphone. Do we have a microphone to pass around? Or should we be able to shout? Okay. Um, Christian, can you be loud? And then we'll. Continue. Yeah, absolutely. It's Christian Aust from Hamburg, Germany, um, freelance journalist. Um, there's, you didn't work in Ireland, there's no Brandon Gleeson, um, but you still decided to stay true to your favorite genre. So what is it that you like? I mean, one that might have thought that you picked a different genre as well, like a depressing... You mean uh, black comedy? Yeah, black comedy, for example. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess there's always drama in the films that I do, but I don't think I'd ever make a film that didn't have humor in it, uh, in one form or another. I've, I mean, I like straightforward dramas, but I always end up finding them a little bit too pompous. I think in, you know, in real life there's always comedy in our lives, there's always drama and there's always a comedy. And uh, if you get rid of one of them, you're kind of being a little bit pretentious. You're basically, I see a lot of films, you see a lot of films, especially during awards season, and they're saying, this is a really serious film. And the reason you know it's a really serious dramatic film is because no one's gonna say anything fucking funny at all. That's how you know it's a serious movie. And my thing is like, well, why can't you have jokes and it still be a serious movie? So that's that's what I attempt to do. Okay. Mike, over here, please. Greta Klaassen, German movie magazine. Um, so, what was the biggest challenge during shooting the movie? Well, I guess you kind of, he's, his moral compass is completely off on, um, he's a horrible cop. Um, but at, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but towards the end of the movie, you kind of have to like the guy enough to root for him and his colleague when they go off to kill the guys that are even worse than they are. So I guess that was something we, I thought a lot about, figure, finding that balance of um, making him crazy and uh, horrible in many ways, but likable enough to for you to root for him towards the end. And which aspect of your film character do you like most? I really enjoy being drunk on screen. <laughs> <laughs> and in a real life. <laughs> it's hard to do good drunk, isn't it? How do you... How do you no, it's quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It is very few. When you look back, there's probably count on one hand the great drunk performances. It's one of the most difficult things to do, I think, you know, to convincingly. If you've had a lot of experience of being drunk, you kind of suss it out quite quickly when people aren't doing it properly. Um, I remember Robert De Niro in The Last Tycoon did a good drunk act. It's not a very popular film. But, uh, yeah, so it's very uh, few and far between. It's a difficult line to cross. Actors often go too far, I think. Well, the trick is to try to be sober because that's like when you're drunk, you don't, I mean, you still try to keep it together. Yeah. Michael Caine said on Educating Rita that, you know, a drunk tries to walk in a straight line. Yeah. Drunks don't stagger. They don't, in their mind, they think right. they're walking yeah. straight. And that was his concept about playing a drunk, is that you're trying to be yeah. walk, walking in a straight line. Yeah. Um, 
Tanya Lipa from Backstage Magazine, um, online space magazine for young people. Um, a question for both of you. Um, how did you brought up that uh, chemistry between you, Alexander, and, and Michael Penna? Um, did you go on drinking tours, spend a couple fest together? You, you couldn't drink too much because you were you still working out on Tarzan or finishing stuff up? Or no, um, not really, but I'm just a very, very serious, diligent actor, John. So when I work, I don't play. <laughs> Uh, usually the most enjoyable thing for me on a movie is drinking with the actors. I mean, if I could not make the movie, I'd prefer not to. If I could just keep drinking with the actors. Well, that's why I got the job. You saw me a drunk a clip yeah. on YouTube of me drunk. At a Hammerby football game. Yeah, that's leading on the, jeering the crowd. Yeah. The crowd. Oh, that's, that's Terry. Yeah, so that's... Um, my advice to young actors out there, go to football games, get shit-faced, and start a riot. And a director will see. A director will find <laughs> How did you prep with, with Michael, though? Did you guys spend a lot of time together? No, we yeah. didn't. I didn't, like, I was a big fan. I think Michael is incredibly funny, um, but in a very subtle way. I think he's brilliant and also a very good dramatic actor. Um, so I was a fan, but I didn't know him at all, and we didn't really have time to to, to spend. We didn't spend much time before we we actually met in Albuquerque about what ten days before we started. Yeah, I think we did three or four days. Went through the script. Yeah, that was about it, really. And John, how did you know these two could be good? Complete leap of faith. <laughs> uh, but you never know. You know, you you can see actors on the screen who you know. Are married to each other who don't have chemistry, you know, so you never know anyway. And then there's other people you hear about who apparently would have arguments all the time, but their chemistry is great, so yeah, you'd never go no one way or the other. But I go, once we were going through the script, we got the feeling you know, the two guys were pretty easy and relaxed with each other, so that was a good start, you know. But then you never know what's gonna how it's gonna pan out, you know. I've always been very lucky with casting and. Um, the actors I've worked with have always been great, and I've never had trouble with anyone really. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. It's me again. Yeah, okay. uh, my question goes to Alexander. I mean, you've been on a show for a very long time. Uh, how did you uh, experience the period after you've been free to choose other projects? One, one might think you feel free, but were there? The opportunities you were looking for, or did they try to typecast you as sexy vampires, or how did you experience this period after? I feel I've been very fortunate. Even while we were shoot, I was on the show for seven years, and I felt like I got some. I got we had five months off every year, and I uh, got to play very different characters from every every single hiatus and, and projects and collaborations that were very different, uh, which is obviously what you you look for as an actor. You want something that feels new and exciting and a kind of bit of a challenge. Um, so I didn't feel that I was uh, typecast or pigeonholed as, as a, playing a vampire or playing a character that's similar very to, similar yeah. to Eric. I, um, and I've, it's bittersweet. Like I had an amazing time on the show. I miss my like family, like the True Blood family, um, and kind of going through that, growing with the show together was an incredible adventure and experience. So um, I miss them a lot, but I was also very ready to move on. I felt like s seven years of playing the same character is, you still have to, you always have to find something, you, you, you need to learn and discover new things about your character. Um, because that's what's fun, you know, like when you're like, oh, I didn't expect the scene to take this turn, or I didn't think my character would do this, but you discover something every day. And that's kind of easy if you do a, a play for a couple of months, or if you do a movie, like this was like two and a half months. But when you should play the same character for seven years, um, and you do like 80 episodes, it can easily become monotonous, and you feel like it's repetitive, and, and that's kind of suicide in a way, creatively, where, because then, you know, it, you, you're bored, and if you're bored, the audience is definitely going to be bored. So that was an interesting challenge to kind of make it um, feel fresh and interesting to me. Um, and I think after seven years, um, 
I was just excited to, uh, you know, be in control of my schedule to be able to take time off when I wanted to take time off and do a movie regardless of when and where it shot. For seven years, I was like, fingers crossed, I can squeeze this into my window that hiatus. And many times it didn't work, and you know, I couldn't do stuff. So, um, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about right now. So, <laughs> what makes sense to us? What would a season be? Would it be nine months? No, it was kind of short, like uh, s s between six and seven months. So we had like it was a really nice job because a lot of people on shows they were it's like 10, 11 months, and then they have a short break. So. I had enough time to do one, maybe two movies every hiatus, plus go home to Sweden to see my family. Um, it was a good life. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized it, you know? So yeah. Now that it's gone. Now that it's gone. <laughs> yeah. You go here and then we'll go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Greg Alba from uh, The Real Rejects, it's a YouTube channel. Uh, my question's for Alexander. Uh, first off, um, I've seen every episode of True Blood, and without a doubt, you and Stephen Moyer were my favorite characters on the show. Thank so you. it's awesome to see you starring in movies right now. Um, my question was more about your uh, preparation process for the character. Uh, I was curious to know, how did you prepare for the character? And I know a lot of times actors come up with a lot of character background that you might not even get to see in the movie itself or portrayed. Is there anything you wanted to share that we might not have been able to see in the film itself? No, nah, not really. I, I was. It's all about if you're ex and it's you know find tap like the creativity starts if you're excited if you're in, in, if you feel this was something it was so different from anything I've ever read before and I was like I mentioned earlier so excited to to do a comedy. I've been I did a comedy in Sweden like ten years ago and. One scene, one scene in Zoolander 15 years ago. Well, that, I haven't done much, so that was, I was just so excited. And, and again, back to being almost a cathartic experience after the intensity of Tarzan, it was so fun to just like go crazy and let loose and, and run with it. Um, and, and, um, and, 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 and just, I've never played a character like that before. And that, um, I always find it hard to talk about my process because I, what I do is I read the script once a day for the, like a month or two before I shoot the movie and every time I read it I come up with new ideas and new thoughts or a way I might want to play a scene or if there's something I want to maybe change I'll you know call, call John about it and then 95% of my ideas will be shit um, you come up with all these ideas but then you kind of Hopefully you find 5% at least that's good, and that becomes kind of the foundation for the character. So that's kind of always my process. I just sit and read it and think about stuff and then discard all the bad stuff and, and, and find those little nuggets. Cool, thank you. John, do you encourage people to improvise at all on set? I wouldn't say I encourage it. Um, <laughs> but I don't mind it when it happens, if it's good. Um, I think, um, I think the thing with Im improvisation, obviously, is that the, the characters have to be good enough and the actors have to be so in tune with the characters that the improvisation comes from an actual real place and they've got the text they can always fall back on. Um, what you find in a lot of movies, I think, with so-called improvisation, it ends up with people shouting at each other, punching fridges, hamming. You know, they do that where they hammer on a car wheel. And they, they think that's, well, done that. that, done that's that. Improvi I'm improvising now, <laughs> I'm hitting this car wheel. Yeah. Um, and it just ends up and sh people shouting at each other. So I think what was good about this, the way the dialogue was written, it was kind of written in an improvisatory way in the sense that both Bob and Terry are so close that they almost know what the other person's going to say. And so there is a basis there that if either the guys come up with an additional line, it kind of it works because of that foundation. Um, I do, I, I'm not a fan of films that are improvised from the start, but that's the concept. We're gonna, this is a vague idea of what the scene is, and you guys just improvise. I find that, I always find those films are quite um, amateurish. And the script was so good, and the dialogue is so spot on. Like, you, like you don't, don't wanna, wanna you don't wanna mess with it. It's like that kind of banter back and forth, and. 
you know, it's it's all I think it's like a symphony. You, know? you wrote a symphony, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and was there there was a lady with a question. Did she have to leave? Oh, we've got a question right there. Thank you. I'm here and trying to focus with my shoe and camera. Right? Mm. <laughs> hey, Alex. Um, uh, will you help us? Yeah, will you be boss, Svenska? Det skulle vara kul. Borde du säga det? Nej, ja, jag borde inte det, men uh, jag blockar på svenska, tyska och engelska. Ja, ah, väldigt bra. Hej alla där ah, hemma. Det här var oväntat att du får göra på svenska. Uh, we're going to do the rest of the, the, the press conference in Swedish now. Is that, is that right? Um, I... <laughs> ja. Ja, det hoppas. So what is, what is she saying? Can you translate for uh. us? Uh, just a little shout out to Sweden. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did that. We talk to Sarah Kristina. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, 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 thank. Are you going to make any projects in Sweden at any point? Uh. Oh, look at this delivery. <laughs> 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 um. I would love to work in Swedish again. Mm -hmm. It's been a while. Do you get 2009? Do you get sent a lot of scripts so that people think, "Oh, he's gone now. He's not going to come back." I don't know. They don't really send me that much. Yeah, they probably think, they think I'm shit. No, they probably think you won't read them. I won't. Maybe. <laughs> oh, really? Um. Well, I was I was in Sweden doing press over the summer, and I was uh, I was really pandering. I was really I love Sweden. I'd love to work here. No, it's it's um I would love to work in Swedish. It's been a while, and there's some really interesting um, filmmakers there now. Jag vill gärna jobba med svenska regissörer på svenska. Det vore kul att göra. Is there another question or back to Christian? It's the you're annoying German from the first row again. Um, John, you write your own scripts. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, you write your own scripts. I hope everybody understood that. Um, how do you usually work? I mean, uh, did you ever consider a script you didn't write? Or um, and also, how, how do you write? I mean, is it hard or is it easy? Or do you work at nights? Or in the morning, or how do we have to imagine it? And why do you write? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, because <clears throat> I'm getting to the point now where I don't want to write original screenplays anymore. I just want to, because I find it's too much boring work. You basically, you're sitting alone in a room for four hours a day. It's, a long, you know, it's really boring. People always talk about writing as if it's some sort of glamorous, exciting sort of life. It's like you're on your own fucking room. I mean, how's that fucking <laughs> Um, so I'm, yeah, so I'm moving beyond uh, writing original screenplays. Now I just want to find books where other authors have done all the work first, and then I'll just adapt. Okay. Um, do I mean it's not you know it's well, not. You don't want to work at all, John. I don't want to work at all. That's what that's what I'm moving towards. Uh, trying to save up enough money to go and retire to Australia. That's basically what. Well, by about the age of 55, so I've got about six years of it. I want to get out of this stupid industry. I just don't want to engage anymore with anybody. Um, I mean, it was the case when I was young, it was the only thing I was any good at. So, you know, I had to persevere with it, basically. Um, I kept getting fired from jobs I didn't want to do anyway. It was just humiliating because, you know, you're being fired for something you don't want. I don't know what you know, the point is. Um, but would I consider other scripts? Yeah, I do, but I find that other people don't write as well as I do. I know that sounds really arrogant, but especially in Hollywood, you get sent a lot of really bad scripts. Every now and again, you'll get sent a script which has got a great idea that has never been, that wasn't properly exploited. And where I was, so I got sent one of those once and I did a rewrite on it. But my comedy was too extreme for the producer. Um, and he said he'd never be able to get it through or whatever. Were you going to direct it? Did you yeah, really write well, it for yourself? No, it was a writing job, but I was so happy with the work I'd done that I then wanted to direct it. Uh, I really liked it. it was like a really big budget action comedy. Uh, 
Um, so well, I, what happened? They just scrapped it. It was. Uh, I'm not going to say it was. It was a well-known producer who's made really well-known films, and he basically said to me, "John, you know the type of movies I make. We, I can never make this script because it's too confrontational. The comedy was too far gone." And I was, I was like, "It's a funny script, though." And he went, "Yeah, it's funny. I can't. I won't get the money for it." So, that was, so we. Well, you couldn't find another home for it. Kind of. He won't release it. I wanted to, I'm oh. trying to get it back, yeah, it won't. I'll tell you later on who it is. Yeah. <laughs> You're only in a room full of journalists, you can mention it. Um, but it was well paid, but, so that was fine. Uh, but yeah, so I would consider other people's scripts and stuff like that. Um, but it's just, I had quite a high standard. And you know, any actor will tell you, you get specifically American scripts that are all written as if by a 24-year-old virgin who's just got out of USC film school, and they live in Orange County, and, they, and they're in their mother's basement. You know, they all read like that. Do you know what I mean? Uh, all of them. All of them. Yeah, you, know, it's sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll get a center script, and it's got a really bad title, and the guy I wrote is called Zach something. And I'll just oh, pass, oh, Zach. I'll pass on the title page. Oh, no, I'm not reading the script because of the title page. Why? Why? Well, Zach wrote it. Zach, Zach something wrote it. I'm yeah, sorry, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's always shit. And sometimes I'll go, I'll give him a break, and you go, no, it's crap. It's, it's always crap. It never surprises you. But it's like a lot of them have read... Yes, they... That, that, that kind of um, Save the Cat, this, like a screenwriting book. So it's very... Yeah. Um, They've all read the manuals. It is, yeah, so you know it's, it, you're rarely surprised, like, you, you know, it's by the beats, like, and now this is going to happen, and the back to one, and now we introduce this character, and here's the villain, and here's that arc, and that's, and now we have the conflict, so it's, um, it's always and, and funny to read something narratively that's different. And they always go, like, the, the lead character is like, he's 30, he's devastatingly handsome. They never go, he's 50, he's as ugly as shit. <laughs> they never do that. So he's like, why bother? Writing that bit in. Alexander, how many scripts do you read? Do you read a ton, or do your agents sort of whittle the pile down before they get to you? Do you have time? Um, I try to read as much as possible. Yeah, they. Yeah, they'll they'll go through it, and if there's Anything something. Zach. It, that's what I told yeah. them basically. If, <laughs> if it's from any Zach, don't even bother. Yeah. Um, um, that's kind of the only criteria. Yeah. If it's not by Zach, I'll, I'm more than happy to read. Um, no, but it's it's like it's good because sometimes. So I did a movie a couple years ago called Diary of a Teenage Girl, that was my neighbor's friend wrote the script, a first-time filmmaker, like less than a million dollar budget, and my neighbor was like, "Hey, my friend Mari wrote this script. She has never directed anything, not even a short, but I think she's really talented. Do you want to read it?" Um, and I loved it, and I had the most amazing experience working on it. And Mari's one of my best friends now, so um, you know it's it's it, you, you it's it's good to kind of be out there and read um, smaller, interesting things, not sit and wait for your agents to send you big budget movies by Zach. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And um, how about? about um, writing your own script, Alexander, and doing your own movie. We have seen um, today um, Hugh McGregor's uh, first directorial film. And maybe that could be something for you, learning from John, being his little padawan. Hugh yeah, McGregor, I he's so good. He's so good. <laughs> <laughs> good for him. Um, uh, well, Ewan, I actually wrote and directed a short film in Sweden 12 years ago. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll do it again. Can you get it on YouTube? Is it available anyway? Uh, yeah. It is. It's called To Kill a Child. Oh, that's a good title. It's catchy. Yeah. It's catchy, yeah. yeah. And my kid brother played the lead. And he dies. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Can I just wrap up by asking you, both of you, what, what you're each working on now? Will you ever work together again? We hope? We'll work together again, yeah, hopefully. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Mulling it, I'm mulling it over. Uh, I'm doing a, looks like I'm doing a HBO uh, miniseries, a finite thing, eight episodes. And I've got two uh, American scripts sort of percolating at various stages. Yeah. You, you planning to work more in America than Ireland now? Uh, well, you know, I'm actually from London, even though my family's Irish. Um, I mean, the two films I made, The Golden Calvary, the third part of the trilogy, I might write that next summer. I've kind of got most of it in my head, but that will mostly be set in London. That'll be the final sort of thing. Um, but as you see, as I'm saying this, it's like, there's so much work. It's already upsetting me. You have to write it. You have to sit in your room and write it. I've write eight episodes, then I have to write this bloody screenplay, and then make the bloody films. When do you think you can retire and get... I was, well, I was hoping for 55, six years, yeah. before that would be enough. Yeah. Hopefully that will be enough. Do you have, do you have another six years in you? I, I don't, well, I don't have my liver as in six years. <laughs> we'll see how it goes with my liver first. <laughs> Um, but uh, no, I, I have become progressively more bored with directing the more I've done it. With yeah. life in general? And, yeah, in, in general. That's why I'm hoping my liver <laughs> cocks out. So I won't have to be alive anymore. <laughs> On that note, uh, thank you very much for coming, guys. What are you shooting next? Do you um, can you... Yes, I'm, um, I just got to Berlin a week ago. So I'm there prepping a movie called Mute by um, Duncan Jones. Oh, yeah. Um, um, it's like, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's uh, about a mute bartender whose girlfriend goes missing, and he. it takes place in Berlin 30 years in the future. So it's kind of a dystopian, dark, uh, futuristic world. And um, he's ex-Amish and can't speak, and chases through the streets of Berlin to find his girlfriend. So you don't speak at all? No. You don't put on any lines, I guess this is... No, but, um, and then we did a couple of, last week we did a couple of screen tests with girls, and fuck, it's hard to not speak. I was like, I, I, and then doing it, I felt like my instinct was always to say something, and then I had to kind of suppress that. But, but I realized you have to come up with a whole, like, cause he's been, it was in a, uh, an accident when he was nine, so he's been mute for 30 years. So. His instinct wouldn't be to say something. He would, you know, obviously come up with a completely different language, with a different way of communicating. Um, so it was this weird feeling where I had to fight my instinct constantly, and I was terrible. Um, so this, it feels great. We're starting a week, and I have no idea what I'm doing. Great, good luck. Go see the movie, guys. <laughs> um, will you two be taking an Oktoberfest tour of Zurich tonight? Uh. <laughs> Uh, I've got to do stuff tomorrow morning, maybe, but you're away tomorrow. A I, week? Are you away tomorrow? Tomorrow afternoon? No, we fly to London tomorrow afternoon, right? No, I'm just, I've got an extra thing to do. I'm oh, here? I'm down on Tuesday. Oh, yeah, I'll fly back tomorrow afternoon. We're um, going to do that in the UK, in London and Dublin. We're doing our premieres this week, so I'm assuming we're going to save, we're going to save ourselves for that. Yeah, and I was, um, we'll see. I mean, I, 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 I went all in yesterday in, in, in München. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much, and thanks for your questions. And just to remind everybody, um, the green carpet for La La Land starts in 15 minutes or less, so you can head on over there. But thank you so much thank for you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.